I love listening to that song, Victory in Jesus. Amen. Man, it gets me going. I don't know which is going faster, my hands, my knees, my mouth, or what. But I am so happy that we have victory in Jesus. Good morning, church. If you just got here, you missed some knee slapping, some back slapping, some palm slapping, and some lip slapping. Okay, we're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at part two of our sermon, Victory in Jesus. Now, last week I shared with you the first part of this and how I'd observed that human beings, we love to celebrate victories. Now, I want to tell you that we have a tendency, though, to forget what goes into those victories. What I mean by that is we have a tendency sometimes to look at, look at the victories from sort of a, an armchair kind of approach, a sideline kind of approach. We watch our favorite teams and we root them on, but none of us were at the practices. None of us did what it took to get the victory. We might have purchased the jersey. We might have the bumper stickers. We might even have the, the, the cozies that go on our favorite beverages. We might even have the ball caps and the window flags that stick out the back of your vehicle. And they see, you can tell them from the south because in the south that's a really big deal. <laughs> you might even be able to get one of those giant sponge fingers that says we're the number one. We love to celebrate victories. But the truth of it is, is while we're celebrating the victories of our favorite teams, none of us were at the practices, none of us were at the trials, none of us did the two-a-days, the three-a-days, none of us were out there for the coaching films, none of us were out there to earn the victories, taking the bumps, the scrapes, the boo-boos, and a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tear. Amen? Amen. And neither, neither were we present at some of these other really great victories. And matter of fact, there might be just one, maybe two individuals in this room right now who are part of that generation, the greatest generation, who remember victory in Europe and victory in Japan. They may have likely had family members, friends, co-workers and neighbors, classmates who did help earn that victory. But none of us did. And so when we have a tendency to think back on victories, we forget what all goes into victories like victory in Europe and victory in, in Japan. VE Day stands for victory in Europe. VJ stands for victory in Japan. It's particularly important for us to know that these two theaters were closed in victory and helped us win World War II. But we didn't win World War II all by ourselves. But the celebration went around the world. There are celebrations that now have been eclipsed by other victories. We like to think about victories in other senses. Maybe because of a sense of achievement. Maybe because we had some money on it. Maybe because we had some kind of alumni relationship. Or maybe because our children play on those sports teams. Or maybe because we have some kind of geographical affiliation with them. Or maybe it's just because we like winners. But we celebrate victories in all kinds of different ways. But the victory we have in Jesus... The greatest victory we could ever be part of, we had absolutely nothing to do with. Amen. Oh, we like to pretend we do. As a matter of fact, there are all kinds of theological strains that say, if you just think hard enough, try hard enough, then you'll gain the victory. You'll have overcome. If you just do enough good... If you just have enough right connections, if you just go to church enough, get active, involved enough, if you just pray enough, read your Bible enough, if you just preach enough, teach enough, and belong and long enough, then you're going to be fine. You'll help win the victory. Every one of the world's religions preaches that kind of mantra that if you just do enough good for a long enough time, you'll gain the victory. Only Christianity, biblically based faith in Jesus Christ, teaches 
He won the victory. Amen. That it is a salvation by grace through faith and not of yourselves. Amen? Amen. So maybe you're asking then, well, why then is victory in Jesus so important? Because your role in this is simply to surrender. Submit. Avail yourself to. Lay it all down. Stop fighting. Why is that important? Because you see, Scripture teaches us that we are at enmity with God. We are at war with God. That we were actually dead in our sins and our trespasses until, listen to this now, Ephesians teaches this, until the power of the Holy Spirit moved over us. Amen? Amen. But a lot of people, a lot of people, have the idea, the mistaken identity in Christ Jesus. And you've heard me teach this. That just because they go, go to a church. They, my, my mom and dad and my grandparents went here. And we even paid for a pew because the plaque on the end of the row says so. And, and we taught Sunday school. And we're involved and we're there every time the lights are on. The doors are open. And, and, and we're sitting there. Uh, that means that I've heard all those sermons. And I've I memorized those verses. And I know those songs. And I get it. But when you walk out the door, you don't act like you got it. But those people think they're genuinely saved. But Jesus says twice in the Gospels, there will come a separation of those who think they are and those who really are. Amen? Amen. So celebrating the victory we have in Jesus means that we need to first understand what it means to be saved. Because let me tell you this, that when we know we have victory in Jesus, our life changes. We literally move from one side of the battle to the other side of the battle. Now some people act like they're, they're, they've, they've made that change, but they're going in Christ more like prisoners of war. Like, well, I guess I have to. You know, I'm going to this church. I'm going to have to go there and I'm going to have to act. Bless God, hallelujah. I'm, I'm a born-again believer. But all the while, they're longing for the life they used to have. All the while, thinking of ways they can escape and as often as they can and they're not under the pastor's watchful eye or a deacon or an elder or a deaconess or a Sunday school teacher or even their, their beloved friend or their spouse. Every chance they get, they're thinking, I'm going to make a run for the wire. My friend, it doesn't matter. Listen to me now. At the risk of alienating some of you, okay, I want to tell you the truth. It doesn't matter how many sermons you sat under here. It doesn't matter how many songs you've sung with here. It doesn't matter how many prayers you have said here. It doesn't matter how much involvement you have here. It doesn't matter whether you preach, you teach, you're an elder, you're a deacon, you're a deaconess, a Sunday school teacher, or you do any kind of other kind of ministry here. It doesn't matter who you know, how long you've known them, or what they did while they were here. What matters is this. Does Jesus have you? Do you have victory in Jesus? Because I'm going to tell you, the seats you're sitting in have heard all of those same sermons, listened to all those same songs, listened to every one of those prayers, been here every time the doors are open, the lights are on, and they've heard everything. And they're no closer to going to heaven than the person who genuinely has no victory in Jesus. Are you with me? Say amen. Amen. Now, for those of you who just heard in a tremendous gospel in capsule form, you've got to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about theology. I'm talking about scripture. I'm talking about doctrinal scripture that teaches that we have no hope but in him. Amen? Amen. I'm talking about that we have to be born again. Jesus said to a Pharisee, how is it that you are a teacher of the law, but know not this? That you must be born again. Read John chapter 3. Jesus put it on a very religious man, Nicodemus, and told him straight out. 
This is what it takes to find victory in Jesus. We have all kinds of ways of celebrating victory in Jesus. I want you to stand with me now and I want you to see what victory in Jesus should look like. What it sounds like and how it should walk like and how it should look like in your life. Because when you go through challenges, this is how you should remember whose you are, what you are, and how you should live. Amen? Amen. Stand up with me. Let's read this together. Coming right out of Romans 8, the most encouraging chapter in the New Testament. Chapter 8. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Stop right there. Did you get that? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what the flesh says. It doesn't matter what the word says. It doesn't matter what your friends, your neighbors, or Satan says. This is the truth of the gospel. Amen? Amen. You can do better than that. Amen. There you go. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's one of those, woohoo! There you go, you're catching on. All right, go ahead. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His Son, His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship and the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope we were saved, but hope this is seen is no hope at all who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now buckle up, here we go. And we know that in, in, in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. 
And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate, separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, say this with me, who sa shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Listen now, say it again. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now look here why. For I am convinced, say it with me, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, there ought to be a woo-hoo. Amen. Let's go to God. God, thank you so much for this incredible chapter of, of, Lord, encouragement. Lord, you have given us so much in your son, Christ Jesus. And you have blessed us, Lord, with life, and not just life, an abundant life and an eternal life. And Lord, you have given us every good thing in your son, Jesus. How could we not walk through this life but anything as victors? So God, I pray that anyone who is here today Anyone who hears and sees this message online, that Father God, they would come and hear the truth of your word and having done so, have the precious power of the Holy Spirit whose presence and peace and power will move over them and in them and to them and through them and move them, Lord, from victim to victor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. So I shared with you last week, he's the victor. And he makes us victors as well. There's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We have moved from one side of the battle to the other side. We are no longer dead in our trespasses, but made alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's victory. Amen? That's victory. We're no longer at war with God, but made alive to God in Christ Jesus. That means we can now live I shared with a young man not long ago of the issue of free will. I said to him, you know, we struggle with the issue of free will so often. We say, well, people have the free will. No, let me explain something to you. Scripture teaches this very clearly that apart from Jesus Christ, you have no free will of your own. Amen. You are held in bondage to sin, death, and hell. You are held in bondage to your sinful nature, your sinful desires. You can't choose to follow Jesus only on your own accord. But not by decision, Scripture teaches. The only way you can be set free to do what God allows you to do, commands you to do, wills you to do, created you to do, and called you to do, is by the power, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Up to that time, you are a slave to sin. Read what Paul says. Paul says, sometimes I, I want to do good, but I can't. That's the everyday struggle, the old nature and the new nature. And he says, as he goes on, I want to do good, but I can't because it is sin within me. The old nature is within each and every one of us. You ever caught yourself saying or doing something you wish you hadn't said or hadn't done? That's pretty much every day for me. All the time. <laughs> Sometimes I say stuff, I'm, I'm up here, I'm speaking in front of a bunch of folks, and I'm thinking, the moment it popped out of my head, I said, you know, that sounded a whole lot better in my head than it sounded coming out of my mouth. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. 
Sometimes that happens. Sometimes we have thoughts. Sometimes we say things and sometimes we do stuff that is not of our Christian spirit, our new nature. It's that old person trying to pop up. Trying to get in the way. That's the struggle we have as new believers. That we got to keep working on being more like him. John the Baptist said, I must decrease that he might increase. Amen. That's our whole lot to grow in Christ Jesus. But the good news is, is we have the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God actually moves over us, moves into us, moves through us, and begins to work on us. He's the empowerer, the enabler, the equipper. He's the indweller who allows us, enables us, and empowers us to live the victorious life in Jesus Christ. That we might know and experience victory in Jesus. So when you mess up, like I said, I mess up. You pick yourself up. You dust yourself off. You say, Jesus, I'm sorry. That wasn't of you. That was of me. God help me. You don't go all the way back to square one. No. You get back up and you find that he has made you the victor as well. Amen? Amen. No. Oh, Christian, listen to me. We have victory in Jesus. You were never created to live depressed, defeated, guilty, condemned, or shamed, or unworthy. You cre were created to be victorious, someone said. And I agree wholeheartedly. You know that you have victory in Jesus when He is your Savior and your Lord. It doesn't matter what the world, the flesh, and Satan say at you. You can claim victory in Jesus. I also told you that he inherited all glory and he makes us co-heirs with his glory. That we are now children of God and as children of God, children of God we now are co-heirs with Christ. Everything that was given to him has now been shared with us. That's amazing how many Christians live like paupers. I like the way C.S. Lewis said it. He said, we're so easily placated and amused. We're like children who are willing to play with mud puddles in the middle of the road when God offers us an all-expense-paid trip to the shore. Must have been from New Jersey. <laughs> Stop living under your calling. Amen? Amen. The world offers you all kinds of enticements and say, oh, but you'll be satisfied with this. Don't be satisfied with that. Don't be willing to settle for anything less than God's best. Amen? Amen? Christ Jesus suffered under the constraints of flesh. I told you that we can't have one without the other. Jesus suffered and then entered into glory. We have the tendency to want to escape all the suffering and go right around that. And we just want the glory part. But Jesus himself told us, in this life you will have many trials, many troubles, but be of good cheer for I've overcome the world. And then he also told his disciples, hey, if they treat me like this, what do you think they're going to do to you? Don't be surprised. Don't get your feelings hurt. Don't get upset. Don't get discouraged. Don't get disillusioned. And don't become defeated when it seems like everything else is coming at you because it will. Anybody ever had a really bad day? Anybody have a really bad, bad day? Anybody ever really had a horrible, horrible day? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever a good day? Now I got to tell you something. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know when you had a good one or if you had a bad one if you didn't have the other, right? If you never had a good day, you'd never know when a bad day was. And if you never had a bad day, you'd never know when you had a good day. You can't say to God, God, only give me sunshine, because you'd never fully appreciate it. And here's a little something for you. You've got to have a little of the rain along the way to make things grow. Amen? Amen? And just for some of you who missed my sermon about the sower, sometimes you've got to have a, one of those really crappy days. You've got to have that to help you grow too. Why? Because it keeps you humble. It keeps you leaning into Him. Helps you looking in his word and depending on him and saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this, but I've had the sun, I've had the rain, and I've had crappy. I'm, I'm just trusting you to help me grow. Amen? Amen. And God will. 
you got to have your time of suffering. Now I spoke with somebody recently and, and he's exactly right. He said, nobody's going to sign up for that willingly. No, they won't. No, they won't. That's why Jesus said, count the cost of being a disciple. Because it's all part of it. Notice what he says. Very, very succinctly. If any man would come after me, let him first deny himself. Pick up his cross. Amen? Mm -hmm. And follow me. Sounds to me like we got to let go of what we want. The way we want it. How we want it. When we want it. With who we want it. And then we got to pick up, then we got to pick up that cross. What is that? That's whatever cost he puts into your life to say, I'm going to use this to refine you to become more like me. Now please hear me. God is far more interested in your character than he is your comfort. Amen? We have a flipped just the opposite in this world today. It's all about us. We can drive the right kind of car, live in the right kind of house, you know, go out with the right kind of people, drink the right kind of liquids, eat the right kinds of foods, dress the right kind of way, and everything's going to go great. We can even go on a cruise ship and go out to the Bahamas and, and go to a place that, you know, I told Glenn the other day when the, when the commercial came on, I said, you know, I don't see any people in that commercial at that resort look like me. I show up and they're not going to film me. Here's my point. The Lord isn't as interested in your comfort. He's interested in comforting you to be like Him and conforming you to be like Him. Amen? Amen. So at those first two points, that's free. Now I've got to burn through these others. Third, look at this. He works all things for the good and makes us good. Paul writes, he says, We know that in all things, stop right there, does all mean some? Most? No, it means what? All. all. Is there anything that's not included in all? No. So next time you're going through something and you're wondering why that's happening to you, you can go right back to this verse and say, and we know. So if all of this other has come before us and we know that we have no condemnation in Christ and we know that he's, he's already gained the victory and he's already shared it with us and we know that we're going to go through suffering but he's also going to make us co-heirs with his glory then and we know comes right into play. The Holy Spirit's going to help us. And all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. You see how this works? He's going to use everything to refine you your character to the conformity of Christ's likeness. Why? Because you don't want to be in heaven with a holy and righteous and loving God who is the all-powerful, almighty God of the universe and not be like Him. It would be not heaven for you. Amen? Amen. So He wants to prepare you for an eternity with Him. We often worry about what we might think happens in our lives. It's been said that 90% of what we worry about never happens and the other 10% we can't control. Did you know that there's not one time in the Word of God where we're commanded to worry? It's true. Not one. In time, and, and instead, we're, we're told repeatedly to not be anxious or worried about anything, but to bring everything to God. But you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that prayer is often our last resort instead of our first best resource. Oh, we'll exhaust ourselves. We'll run around. We'll, we'll talk to anybody and everybody who will listen. And we'll get all things. And we'll try to figure it out. We'll wear out our bank accounts. We'll worry ourselves. We'll lay on our pillows at night trying to think through. We'll try to figure out our, uh, everything we can come up with to solve the problem. Even before it's happened. But God's word says, cast all your cares on me for I care for you. Amen. 
Philippians 4 is a really great go-to verse. We're told repeatedly to come to Him. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And it starts off with a, an interesting word. It begins with, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, let your petitions and your prayers and your requests be made known to God. Anything and everything sounds an awful lot like all things. Amen? And so we see in Romans 8, all things. We got to get to the place where our faith outweighs our fear. We got to get to that place where we're able to see and say, No, God, you got this. Billy Graham once said, The will of God will not take us where the grace of God cannot sustain us. You got to recognize and believe that whatever God brings you to, God will bring you through. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter what it is. When you get to that place, you can remember that verse and you can say, God, I get it. All things. All things. Number four. He's with us. He's for us and nothing can stand against us. Paul says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How we not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We have victory in Jesus. We weren't meant to be victims of circumstance. Oh, I remember that when I worked with the uh, at-risk youth or folks from the halfway house programs, I would begin to ask them, hey, Tell me your story. And they would always start with something like this. See what happened was. Okay. And what this does is sets for them a narrative that almost immediately begins a victim mindset. What happened to me was this. And what I want to share with you is, is that as long as you identify as a victim, it will continue to be your get out of jail free card. For why you never did, why you can't, why you won't, why you won't be successful, why your relationships don't work out, why you don't have peace of mind and spirit, why you don't have faith to overcome your fears, why you don't achieve certain things, why you can't break free of generational cycles of sin, why you go on and it just goes on and on and on and on. Because see, what happened to me was, and the reason I know that, after years of working with those populations and years in ministry, is the second question is, is what have you done about it? What, what do you mean? All of us. All of us have something. All of us, according to Scripture, deal with issues. It's not what happened to you. It's what has happened to you. Are you with me saying that? You see, all of us have that history. It doesn't matter what it is that got you to that place. What matters is, is what happened to you when you met Jesus. 
What happened to you when you let go and surrendered to him? What happened to you when the power of the Holy Spirit moved over you and in you and to you and through you? What happened to you when you let go of all those hurts and those habits and those hangups? What happened to you when you let go of that anger? What happened to you when you let go of those controlling behaviors? What happened to you when you let go of those insecurities? What happened to you when you let go of those abuses or those neglects? What happened to you when you let go of all those things that happened to you and you stepped into and out of that old life and into new life? What happened to you when you moved from being a victim to a victor? What? I, I don't know what you mean. This chapter. This chapter tells us the answer to that. From verse 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not from the flesh. Not from the world. Not from Satan. Not from your past. Not from your present. And not from your future. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So my friend, I'm going to ask you. Did you have that defining moment in Jesus? Where you move from victim to victor. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Now when you do that and you find this incredible, incredible truth. He is with us. He is for us. And nothing can separate us and stand be between us. It's, it's an amazing thing. The next time your flesh pops up and says, Oh, but you remember what you did? Yeah, I did it. Yeah, I said it. That was me. But that's been covered by the blood. I've been forgiven. Satan can't say another thing against you. Can't say another word about you. Number five. This is the most amazing part right here. He will never leave us. And nothing can separate us. From his love for us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Wow. Now I got to tell you. I know this is going to come as a surprise. I'm not all that lovable. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> oh, thank you, Joe, uh, Jesus, for your promises here. Look at here. Look what Paul, Paul says this. It's beautiful. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor either angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Wow! Man, it doesn't matter what you're dealing with. It doesn't matter how long you've been dealing with it. It doesn't matter what the flesh is saying to you or what the world's saying to you or what Satan's saying to you. It doesn't matter how long those voices are saying it, how loud those voices are saying it. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is what God said over you. Amen? And God's Word says we are victors in Jesus and the love of God, the love of God can never, ever be taken from us. Amen? Amen. He will never leave us. This is the greatest news ever heard by mankind. Second to the news that the angel proclaimed that first Christmas when it says, God with us. Well, what's one thing to walk alongside somebody? I have a precious spouse. She's walked alongside me through many, many things. But there were times when, either because of my work or military or some dangers, some other circumstances, or even my own, my own struggles. I had to walk alone. But I wasn't really alone. Though the precious love that she is, she couldn't be there with me through all of those things. But there was one who sticks closer than a brother. And he was with me through every. Those dark nights when I struggled with my soul. Those dangerous days in the military or in law enforcement. The heartaches of dealing with old hurts. 
my God was there and nothing could separate us. Nothing. And to know that He loved me that much, to walk every mile with me, has been a blessing. I read a quote this past week that I wanted to share with you. It says, you know, that, that old, that famous uh, uh, line that says, you know, I saw two footprints walking through the sand. And the Lord, I, I, was that where I walked alone? And the Lord says, no, that's where I carried you. Amen. Well, this one had a little addendum to it. It says, the Lord says, you know those drag marks <laughs> that went from there? That? That, that's where I had to drag you kicking and screaming. <laughs> That's me, amen. That's me. God loves us so much. He never will leave us nor forsake us. And as victors, we can look back over all of our lives. And we can say, I have victory in Jesus. It's an amazing thing to be able to celebrate that victory in Jesus. Yet, all too many believers fail to realize the abundant life they have in Christ Jesus as victors as conquerors over all these things that they've been afforded through Christ. And it isn't because God failed them. It isn't because Christ's shed blood wasn't sufficient to cover their sin. It isn't because the Holy Spirit's power is somehow impotent over them. And it isn't because they haven't heard the truth of God's word or about God's will or even about God's way. And it's because they've chosen to live not as victors, but as victims. It's it's because that's where their identity is. And they're hesitant to give it up. They would rather remain in that kind of mindset than be made aware of the truth. And even when the truth's been made aware to them, they resist it. That's the way it was for Haru Anoto, who remained in the jungle of the Lubang Island near Luzon in the Philippines until 1974 because he didn't know and refused to believe that the war had ended. He was finally persuaded to emerge after his aging former commander was flown in by authorities to see him. Correspondents say he was greeted as a hero on his return to Japan, but that he was very fearful that World War II had actually ended. The story is that Onodo, then a lieutenant, became cut off from his main troops as the U.S. soldiers moved in in Lubang. The young soldier had been receiving orders not to surrender, a command he'd obeyed for three decades. Every Japanese soldier was prepared for death, but as an intelligence officer, he was ordered to conduct these guerrilla warfare tactics and not to die. He shared with an ABC News interview in 2010, I became an officer and I received an order. If I could not carry it out, I would feel shame. I am very competitive, he added. He refused to surrender even after his former commander rescinded his orders. He had to wait until he had confirmation. While on Lubang Island, Mr. Oneida surveyed military facilities engaged in sporadic clashes with local residents. Three other soldiers who were with him at the end of the war, one emerged from the jungle in 1950. The other two died hiding in the jungle. Mr. Oneida ignored several attempts to get him to surrender. He later said that he dismissed search parties and leaflets dropped by Japanese aircraft as ploys by the enemy to confuse him and get him to surrender to the enemy. Finally, in March of 1974, with his commanding officer traveling all that way to see him, personally ordered him to surrender. And they walked out together. Mr. Oneida saluted the Japanese flag and handed over his samurai sword all while still wearing the remnants of his tattered World War II uniform. The Philippine government granted him a pardon. That was necessary because over the 30 years that he'd been remaining in battle, he had killed some 30 villagers in his campaign in the war. 
He'd blown up and destroyed several government vehicles. Mr. Oneida was one of the last Japanese soldiers to surrender at the end of World War II. Another soldier, Private Teru Nakamura, a soldier from Taiwan, served in the Japanese army. He was found growing crops alone on an Indonesian island of Moratora in December of 1974. I'm here to tell you the war is over. Victory is won. We have victory in Jesus. Come out. Stop fighting. Enjoy peace. A lasting peace. Amen. The worship team's going to come. The world says this is what we look for. Peace at last. But there can be none until we recognize we have victory in Jesus. And when we find victory in Jesus, then we'll have a peace that passes all understanding. My friends today, whatever you're dealing with, whether it's a health issue, relationship issue, spiritual issue, financial issue, whatever you're dealing with, you can set that down. Stop fighting. Let it go. Come and find yourself on bended knee, bowed head, broken heart. Lay it down. Find peace. Stand with me.